Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hope we had a nice lunch. And um, the purpose of this presentation is to prepare us for Lent. Um, for those who may be watching this on video, um, this is February the 20th. Lent begins March the 6th, I believe, Wednesday. And, um, and also, for those this in, who are watching this, it is cold, it's damp, and it's rainy. <laughs> we're just lucky we're not in Minnesota. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be digging out of the snow until Easter. So, <clears throat> the purpose of this is to bring us to an understanding of what Lent is about. Now, I'm going to begin rather in an interesting way. Ash Wednesday comes up, and everybody gets in line and receives a sign of the cross on their forehead and in ashes. Now, we do not realize the prophetic reality of this. Go to your Bible and find the prophet Ezekiel Get to chapter 9. And the action starts on verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. The setting for this is after the destruction of Jerusalem. Ezekiel, by the way, is of the high priestly caste. And most of the prophets are also uh, priests, by the way. And so, the Lord shows him a destroyed temple, the pagan abominations that are there ever since Jerusalem had been conquered and people taken into exile to Babylon. And the Lord has, gives Ezekiel this vision. And there are two, I guess you might call them angels. And the angels have a job to do. They have a box that scribes would carry. Sort of like the early version of a laptop, okay? And they have an inkwell, an ink horn. And the Lord is going to tell them, put a, and I'm going to leave a blank, Take your ink and put a, I'm going to use, I'm going to say a blank on every, on the forehead of everyone who is mourning or weeping because of the abuse and the destruction of the temple. People who mourn the absence of God. Now, I'm going to fill in the blank. First of all, if you have perhaps a revised standard version, the King James Version, uh, the new RSVP, maybe, it'll say, put a mark on their forehead. Well, unfortunately, that's really not the nice translation. It says in the Hebrew text, and it'll also be in the New American Bible, uh, likewise, the Jerusalem Bible, the Hebrew text tells the angels, put a tau, a tau, T-A-U, on their forehead. Now, what is a tau? That is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. However, if you get your Hebrew dictionary, or you go on Google and go find a Hebrew alphabet, you will see a certain figure. Unfortunately, the alphabet that you look at, that really isn't the Hebrew alphabet. It's really the Aramaic alphabet, 
And the Jews have been using that alphabet to spell their language since around 200 or 300 BC. Well, what was the alphabet that Ezekiel was familiar with? Known as Paleo Hebrew Script. Oh, and by the way, I even have an addition. I don't know if this is accurate or not, but what type of alphabet did Moses have? He came out of Egypt. It's actually, they look like hieroglyphics anyway. So, the Paleo-Hebrew script was still in use at the time of Jesus, but only among priests, and there's a few other examples in the uh, end of the first century. Well, the original Paleo-Hebrew script, the Tau, the last letter of the alphabet, it looked like a Latin cross. It looked like a cross and kind of tilted this way a bit. The sign of the cross on their forehead. Isn't that fascinating? The powerful prophecy. So there's more happening when you go and receive ashes in the form of a cross. And um, a lot more is going on because that this is the uh, witness of how we too may be in mourning for those things we have lost, especially in terms of our relationship with God. So, to continue here, the three most important words in sacred scripture, they're sort of like the foundation columns of the whole Bible. The first one is teshuva. The word means turn or return. The other word is zikar, which means memory. Zachariah, a prophet, his name means God remembers. And the last one is berit, which is the word for covenant. It's the same word, by the way, for a marriage. A relationship. And so you have those three things. Return, memory, covenant. Look at the Last Supper. Look at the Last Supper. Jesus talks about do this in memory of me. The cup of the new everlasting covenant. And when we go to Mass, what do we say? The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Teshuva, he returns. Isn't it? It's all wrapped up there. I'm going to focus because of Lent, I'm going to focus upon that word, teshuva, to turn. This word is extremely important in its various forms and tenses. That word appears in Scripture, by my count, 1,003 times. Interestingly enough, love appears 410 times, by my count. So. I'll, I'll stand corrected if you find a few more, okay? No problem. So that tells you how important that idea of return is. And when we receive ashes, one of the formulas is turn from sin, be faithful to the gospel. Turn. The entire season of Lent is itself is about turn. And... Um, <clears throat> There's a very important examples that you can find in the Old Testament. For example, Psalm 22, verse 28. They will remember and turn to the Lord. Notice the connection between memory and turn. What is the last thing that anybody ever said to Jesus before he died? The Gospel of Luke. 
a person is crucified on the right side of Jesus, the man turns to him, turns. The last thing anybody ever said to God when he was on this earth, before his death, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus has to turn to him, which had to be very painful to do if you're crucified. Turns to him. This day you will be with me in paradise. Also we have in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 15, second Chronicles, chapter 15, verse 4. They turned and sought the God of Israel. I find it also fascinating, the prophet Zechariah chapter 1 verse 3, where the Lord says, turn to me and I will turn to you. Go back to that image. In fact, that's one of the constant refrains we hear during Lent. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's a famous chant that goes with that very often. Turn to me and I will turn to you. And its most important appearance is in the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verse 24. If you have a King James Version, that would be chapter 4, verse 6. But Malachi, chapter 3, verse 24. The last word of the Old Testament and the last word of prophecy. And I will send Elijah before you. And what is his mission? To turn the hearts of fathers to their children. This is about the return of Elijah who will usher in the appearance of the Messiah. That verb is so important that the last word of the Old Testament becomes the first word of the New Testament. You can go right from Zechariah and start the Gospel of Luke. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, is of the high priestly category called Zadokites. They're the only ones that are allowed to go inside the holy building. He goes in to offer the incense. No doubt it's uh, Friday at sundown, beginning the Sabbath. And he has a vision of the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel said, and you will name him John in Hebrew, Yahanan, because he will turn the hearts of the fathers. He will turn people back to the Lord. Yahanan, by the way, means God is gracious. I might ask you this. He will turn many in Israel to the Lord. Same words as at the end of the prophet Malachi. Notice that the angel that does this is called Gabriel. That's interesting. The first time the angel Gabriel appears in the Bible is actually um, prophet Daniel. Daniel cannot figure out the prophecy in the book of Jeremiah on the 70 weeks. And Gabriel has to come and say, help him with his Bible study, and say it's 70 weeks of years, and he explains something to him. The angel Gabriel, which actually means the strength of God, and it's no coincidence that it is Gabriel that appears to Zechariah, and it's Gabriel that appears to the Blessed Mother, because Gabriel is the angel of God's story with human beings. God's history with us. And the ancient rabbis would interpret in the book of Genesis where it says that the Lord put a angel to guard the tree of life so humans couldn't get to it. And the answer was, what angel is it? And the answer was Gabriel. The tree of life itself is a prophecy because the tree of life, the tree of life is the cross of Christ. It is the crucifix. Give a little background. Ancient rabbis, you always end up with kids, you know, and kids always have <coughs> questions, correct? Okay, so you're there at yeshiva, and some boy, you know, stands up, 
Rabbi, what is it, Levi? You said there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's right, Levi. Rabbi, what is it, Levi? What type of tree is it? Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. And so the answer to that was it's a lemon tree. Uh, actually, it's not a lemon as we would know it. It's called an ethrog. It's a symbol. For those of you in my Bible study in the Gospel of John, it's one of the symbols of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, it's like a very large, it's a citron. It's, it's about, it looks like a lemon. It's very large, though, and probably tastes a little bit better. And so, but there's another tree. So here we back are in class, and little Levi has to raise his hand. Rabbi, what is it, Levi? What kind of tree is the tree of life? Oh, no. Well, the answer was in uh, <clears throat> the reading today from Genesis. Noah sets a dove out, and what does the dove bring back? The, an olive leaf. The only thing to survive the deluge is an olive tree. And for that reason, they said that the tree of life is an olive tree. You notice St. Paul will talk about the cross of Christ and he always uses this expression. He always uses the expression, tree of the cross. The word and also tree of life in Hebrew is etz chaim. And if you go to a synagogue, an orthodox synagogue that I'm familiar with, remember the Torah is always in a scroll. But the people in the congregation, it would be printed as a book. And one of the editions of the Torah, first five books of the Old Testament, is called Etz Chaim, Tree of Life. The very scripture is considered the tree of life. The Torah is the tree of life. And if I, and those of you in the Gospel of John study already know that if we were to reverse engineer the opening words of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. In Hebrew, it would be Berashich HaTorah. In the beginning, the Torah. The whole world was created through the Torah. That's ancient rabbis. The tree of life is Jesus Christ. His cross. Notice we say in the Creed and the Gospel of John, the universe was created through the sun. And so when we look upon the cross upon our foreheads that we would see, when we look upon the crucifix, we're looking at the tree of life. More than just, we're all accustomed to that, but to realize that it's the cross, the crucifix is the tree of life. I will mention, you can find this on the internet, but if you go to Rome, near the Colosseum, is a famous church, St. Clement, San Clemente. And I would further point out that there's actually the present church from the 8th century is on top of another one from the 4th century, which is on top of the house, the palace of Flavia Domitilla, daughter of the Emperor Vespasian became a Christian. She is exiled and left her, estate, her house to the Christians in Rome. So there's been a place in Rome where the Eucharist has been celebrated since the latter part of the first century. Same spot. In the present church there in the apse is a mosaic of the crucifixion. But what's interesting about that presentation of the crucifixion is that it shows coming out of the cross of Christ this twirling vine. You can look on the internet and look up the church. You'll probably even see it yourself. It's like all of the vegetation life, but then it shows birds and animals, you know, eating its fruit and everything like this. The tree of life coming from the very cross of Christ. I would point out also <clears throat> the word, the idea of return. 
We return to the cross. We turn to the cross. This idea of return is so important in Scripture that the ancient rabbis uh, said that, realized, that there were, th or I put it, let me put it to this one a question. Before the creation of the universe, what already existed? Well, God existed, of course. <laughs> hey, how about angels? Right? Uh, heaven, because they've got to be somewhere. <laughs> well, the ancient rabbi said the seven realities were created by God before the creation. And the first thing that God created was his word, Torah. Well, what's the second thing God created? And this is really just fascinating how that they would come up with this. The second thing that God created was Teshuvah, return. Imagine an action, not a thing but an action, a movement. Uh, for those of you, for the sake of scholarship, you can discover this if you read the Talmud. The Talmud is an edition of the interpretations and the wisdom of the, of, of the ancient rabbis. Um, there's the Jerusalem Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, the stories, the interpretation of the Torah meanings. Uh, it's, it's a standard uh, that every Jew reads the Torah as well as the Talmud for understanding. And this is the Talmud, and where you find it is the Talmud tractate Neradim, paragraph 39b. So for those of you who are interested and want to look it up. And so as we come together, I'm going to conclude my presentation uh, with this, is that at the Last Supper, the Last Supper. It tells us that in the that after the Last Supper they sang some songs, really psalms, before going out to the garden. Well, you just don't do any psalm. There are psalms that are called the Hillel, Hillel Psalms. One of them is Psalm 116. It's verse 12. What return can I make to the Lord? What return can I make to the Lord? And the answer is in the next verse. The cup of salvation I will raise. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. And again, another psalm, not a Hillel psalm, but one to keep in mind. It's a prayer. And we will recite it. We'll, it's one of the psalms we'll hear during Lent. Psalm 80. Lord, make us turn to you. Let us see your face. And we shall be saved. And those words at the Last Supper to Thomas. He who sees me has seen the Father. Thank you. Normally this would be about a two-hour graduate lecture, but anyway. <laughs> but I don't think I want to keep you all that long. <laughs> well, we'll test you out. Yes, yes, I'm going to do a Q&A. Let me get my water. Any questions here, anybody? Father, mm -hmm. you said there were the two things. Mm -hmm. What were those? Yeah. Go ahead and look it up. <laughs> Yeah, Neradim, Talmud, Neradim, 39b. Okay, well, um, how do you spell that? N-E-R-A. N-E-R-A. D-I-M, 39b. Another thing, I'll take another one, a third one, the name of the Messiah. 
How about that? You know, so. and that was the dwelling place of God, yeah. angels, and a few others, yes. Thank you, Levy. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? All right. Well, I'm glad this is clear, and so I hope this will help you as you go through Lent, keeping that image in mind. Okay, thank one, you. One more thing, Father. What? You know, I'm just curious, because it was seven things, but it was seven days. Does that have a correlation? Uh, in a way, yes, because seven is a divine number. Uh, the ancient Hebrew mystics, it's called, and uh, the Latin term for this is called gematria, and it is that numbers are signifiers. They have mystical meaning. And so the number seven in Jewish mysticism and the ancient Christians would have been familiar with it since the first Christians came out of Judea and Galilee, not from Texas. <laughs> Although you could get into an argument with some people about that. But anyway, uh, well, well, it, it started up against the Cane Creek Revival in Kentucky. But anyway, uh, they were very familiar with that. And so the number seven is the number for something that is divine. But the number six is for something that is human. You will notice at Christmas, if you read the genealogy, in both Matthew and also in Luke, there are 42 generations behind Jesus. Six times seven. All right. Also, for those of you who are plagued with the number 666, that means humanity at its worst uh, the fullness of God is 777, and by the way, the, uh, by the way, the uh, 666 is not a big mystery. By the way, the book of Revelation is, 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 the symbolism is easy, but you have to be a high priest of the temple in the first century to know what it means. <laughs> and so, uh, it's, 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 it's the liturgy, what happened, the book of Revelation actually takes the liturgy of the temple and it's peeled backwards. It doesn't do what it was supposed to do. And for those of you coming to the Bible study this Monday, we'll be doing something on John 10 and it's the last part. Jesus is on the Temple Mount in Hanukkah. And Jesus says, the, uh, that's where Jesus says, the Father and I are one. That's the 25th day of the winter month of Cheslev, which sometimes matches our solar calendar as December 25th. And the, uh, the Father and I are one. Now, if you go to the book of Revelation, this is building up to 666, by the way, you will notice that this person is a Christian, Right? And he has a vision in chapter 11. And it says, now project, let's, let's pretend. In two minutes, we're going to get a vision of heaven. Okay. One minute and 47 seconds. What do you think you're going to see? Well, this person has a vision of heaven, and guess what he sees? The Ark of the Covenant. This is a Jewish vision, not a Christian one. In fact, it happens twice. Then go to the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. It says, the temple is now no more. He was seeing the temple in heaven. God's home. The temple's no more. The lampstand's no more. The throne is no more. Throne mysticism is the highest form of mysticism in the Old Testament. You'll see that in Ezekiel and in, and in Isaiah. Remember last month, last week. Because why? Because now God and the Lamb are the temple. The Father and I are one. And Jesus says that at Hanukkah right in front of the temple. At the portico of Solomon. Right at the gate of the temple. Well, when's heaven going to change? 
next week, next year. Heaven's already changed. The book of Revelation is actually a Eucharistic archaeology. A Eucharistic archaeology. Heaven changed with take and eat, this is my body. Jesus changed the nature of how we relate to God. If we cannot have something better than Moses had, then he is not the Messiah. And that this gets you ready for the triduum. Thursday, the cross, Good Friday, resurrection. That whole process from Eucharist to resurrection, the nature of heaven is changed. It's already happened. Now for 666. Ancient Hebrew, every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has an assigned number to it. And it's not like one, two, three, four, five. No, it's all kinds of numbers. And we know how certain things are spelled because of correspondence between Judea and the Senate of Rome, etc. And the name in Hebrew for Nero Caesar is pronounced Neron Kaisar. And if you add up every one of those Hebrew letters, get what you get, 666. Simple. All right. So, anybody else? Any other one? Okay, well, thank you all very much.